Hello and welcome, Regina. It's good to see you again. Yes, you too, Cole. Yeah, and we'll tell people about uh, maybe the first time we met. Um, but before we do that, do you mind introducing yourself to my audience, telling us a little bit about yourself as well? Sure. Um, so uh, my name is Regina Moore. I am a pharmacist and uh, I'm mostly retired from pharmacy at this point. I don't work very much, maybe a day or month. Um, I should use my official title, Dr. Regina Moore, but I don't throw that out too much. Um, I live out in Oregon on the coast in an area that's got lots of mushrooms. So I'm a big fan of mushroom foraging. Um, I've also had a longtime interest in psychedelics. It's probably one of the uh, one of the factors in becoming a pharmacist. My dad's a pharmacist too, so I already had the little bit of a nudge there with a parent in the profession, but um, definitely had an interest in specific types of drugs. And uh, let's see, what else? Um, I'm a co-founder of the Psychedelic Pharmacists Association. It's a nonprofit space um, for pharmacists, but also other people who are interested in more of that science uh, side of things and potentially psychedelics as medicine um, to learn and network. Uh, I was on their board of directors from the founding in 2021. Time doesn't doesn't work real well anymore, but um, I stepped down from the board of directors last summer and uh, I'm on the advisory board now. And uh, I also run a business called Women's Personal Finance. Mentioned that I'm semi-retired, um, so have done fairly well financially and uh, now do a lot of um, public outreach, education, financial empowerment type stuff. That's awesome. That's awesome. And yeah, that's one of the first things I learned about you because I'm going to share my screen right now. You had this bag and we'll we'll tell people where we met here in a moment, but you had this bag and I was like, this bag is freaking awesome. And you said you got it from like a pharmacist co co uh, convention or something like that. I totally yeah. thought it was like from a, you know, like a place we were at and we were <laughs> at Psychedelic Science 2023. So that's where we met right. in Denver. Yeah. yeah, I picked that up, I think, at the National uh, Community Pharmacy Pharmacists Association, one of their annual meetings, and that would have been before 2009, so maybe 2007 or 2008, and uh, you know, one, this is back when there was a little more swag out there to be had, too. You don't see a lot of um, drug company-related swag. I think this was, was from a generic drug manufacturer, but um, they definitely had a had a, a prime piece maybe more than they realized so that will be a, a part of my collection for many years yeah and for our listeners i should say the bag says so many drugs so little time and uh, i feel like that's just my life story and i'm probably not the first person to make that joke um <laughs> but anyways yeah like i said we met at psychedelic science 2023 i believe that gene lacy introduced me to you and uh you know, uh, we've recently reconnected. I wanted to give Dennis uh, Walker from Micropreneur a shout out. We recently reconnected at his incubator and some of the discussion that has come up and I've seen these headlines, I'm going to display one right now and then we'll back up for a moment. Uh, but some of these headlines that have been in the news lately have been like the unregulated sale of Amanita muscaria mushrooms needs a public health response. Before we get into the headlines and the news, I wanted to show people some pictures of Amanita mushrooms for a moment. And can you tell us, like, what are Amanita mushrooms? Uh, maybe we just start there and then um, go on maybe to the headlines. Does that sound good? Sure. Um, so uh, so Amanita mushrooms is, uh, is, is actually a fairly large group of mushrooms. There are many in the Amanita genus. Um, one of them is the toxic uh, Amanita phylloides. So um, it's, a, it's a definitely an interesting subsection of mushrooms. And then um, there are a, a portion within that group um, Amanita muscaria, the most common one you see that's often got the bright red cap, um, is in there along with uh, another less well-known but still popular in the Amanita world, um, Amanita pantherina. And uh, these are uh, species, along with some others that are less common, that produce two main um, psychoactive uh, chemicals, uh, mucimol and ibotenic acid. 
And there are some other um, chemicals constituents in there too, especially we start to learn more and more about different things in a lot of um, fungal species. But uh, it is uh, arguably one of the older, um, I don't know, fungal uh, medicines or, uh, you know, uh, with cultural use. And um, uh, there's a history definitely in uh Asia and up into Russia and Europe, um, some questions maybe even about use in India and references it to um, Amanita muscaria maybe being uh, Soma, uh, a lot of different different theories on that kind of thing, but um, it kind of uh, went out of common popularity in the West, though it's remained popular in other parts of the world and is also um, considered to be a choice edible mushroom when prepared correctly in some places, like in Mexico, they eat it fairly regularly from what I understand. Um, but it's definitely uh, getting a big resurgence in interest right now in uh, in America in particular, um, I think riding off of the, the general like psychedelic mushroom hype, given that they are legal in every state in the U.S. except Louisiana. I think there might be a couple caveats of some loopholes in other states, but generally speaking, they're legal and they will intoxicate you in large enough uh, doses. So we're seeing them explored a lot more and also in commercially available products now. Yeah. And, you know, not to to get into another topic, but it just the topic itself reminds me of like the farm bill and, and some of these hemp derived products where it's like people are wondering, like, why all of a sudden have you seen a, a surge? Uh, maybe that's not the right word, a preponderance of these products. And it's like, well, because they're not illegal. And like you said, I think I think you really actually identified another part of it that really spurred the preponderance, if that's the right word. I'm having trouble with words, I guess, today, uh, which is the kind of the psychedelic movement, right? That may right. have influenced like the popularity of these things. Um, they look a lot cooler than the regular like psilocybes too. Well, and I was just going to say, like, I feel like it's the only like, mm, it, it's not a psychedelic. You can correct me on that, but it's the only like, or maybe it is. I, I don't know exactly how to classify it, but let's just say it's the only drug that I feel like most people already know what it looks like. I mean, there's the emoji. We're looking at that right now. Um, the Mario mushroom, like it just, it seems like in pop culture, like people are like, like if they saw these mushrooms, they'd be like, they maybe couldn't name Amanita muscaria, but they're like, why do I, why do right. I know this red mushroom with the white spots? And like ubiquitous too, like you see it on like Christmas cards from like yep. the turn of the century and um, a lot of, a lot of places. And like, they're really beautiful, especially if you see like a nice deep red specimen, they can be kind of glossy. Like they, they don't always look real. Yeah. Yeah, straight up, straight up. They look like a cartoon, cartoon <laughs> mushroom. Um, so, so it, it is it a psychedelic? I guess can we start before we get into the headlines? Like I, I've heard it's a deliriant. Maybe it's a psychotropic. Like there's a lot of different yeah. words I've heard. Uh, so I mean, th I, th I think this is a hard one to give like a yes or a no answer sure. on because the term psychedelic is like a lot more broadly used than right. like even in my uh, like historical narrative of how I would use that word. Um, so I think. Most people would say that it isn't really a psychedelic. Um, at high enough doses, it can be a hallucinogen potentially, but it's not anything like uh, like psilocybe mushrooms or um, or LSD. Uh, it is more like a dissociative or deliriant. Um, uh, probably a closer. Well, assuming assuming you're you're going for the musimol portion, which is what has been more classically uh, used when people are experimenting with Amanita. They're trying to get um, most of the ibotenic acid out. Um, it's more like alcohol or uh, benzodiazepines like Xanax, and it's more that kind of a thing um, mm. versus a traditional, like, going to have a visual trip. Right. And I realize now that I've asked that question you you perfectly answered it and why that was kind of kind of a bad question because like as you said um you know that definition of psychedelic it's like kind of uh flexible right now i don't know that it's solid like i i just listened to speaking of dennis i need to figure out what podcast it was but i listened to a podcast that dennis 
appeared on and he was talking about how like cannabis and a lot i agree with this cannabis could be considered a psychedelic at, at higher doses but maybe not at lower doses uh yeah just depends you know so i i really like how you approached uh that question because um it can provide a mind altering experience i guess we can say that right it, is that a, a fair phrasing yeah <laughs> Yeah. And I'll try to have that podcast linked in the show notes. I did just find it. It was a reality sandwich. So if folks want to check that out. Um, but anyways, uh, back to the headlines. Now that we've kind of established what Amanita muscaria mushrooms are, what people are shooting for, which is like the muscamol um, typically. Um, so let's talk about these headlines, right? Because these products are are legal. What's been what's been going on from like your perspective? Um, all right. So um, like backing up further, right? I live in Oregon, and mm -hmm. Amanita is pretty prolific, especially where I live. I'm I back national forest. Uh, I uh, so I started paying a lot more attention to like, you know, the, what was happening and being talked about with Amanita probably about four years ago. Um, because I, like, I had like this sense that like, well, one, you see it on like mushroom forums and people will be like, my kid touched this mushroom. Like I heard it's poisonous. Are they going to die? And, and so there was obviously like a lot of baseline fear with it. Um, and I knew that that wasn't accurate. But I was able to pick up that like there are definitely people who are like using this mushroom in in other ways. So clearly it's not just straight up toxic. Um, and uh, so I started paying a lot more attention and getting involved into some in some forums. I also forage mushrooms and have sold mushrooms like culinary mushrooms to local restaurants and things um, and wanted to be able to start offering Amanita. <laughs> and I'm a pharmacist, so I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to be doing something that I'm not, I don't want to kill somebody here. Um, and uh, started joining some of the Amanita specific groups. Um, at this point, I'm one of the um, moderators on a pretty large Amanita Facebook group called Amanita Magic and Science. And what we have seen over the last few years there as um, this like huge pop culture interest in Amanita has risen is that there are a lot more people who are trying to gain access to Amanita products. They don't really understand what they're going for. They just think like it's a psychedelic and it's legal or they may even think like it's a magic mushroom. And I guess it's arguable. You could call it that too, right? It has some effects. Um, and uh, and commercial products have started to pop up. So what we were seeing at first, um, most commonly was uh, like gummies starting. People were mentioning they're getting all these different types of gummies. Um, and at there's also people who are making their own tinctures and, and different things that they sell in that has traditionally been like fairly small batch, you know, they're doing it in, in their, in their homes or in, in small businesses. And it's a, been a pretty niche market, but with this explosion into the gummy space, it starts to look a lot more like things that you see uh, at dispensaries, a lot more uh, fancy branded packaging. Um, what really uh, uh, got me interested in tracking that highly though, was seeing the, like the marketing language that it was being, was being used. Um, because they were referring to um, to like uh, uh, psilocybe cubensis strains, like uh, like blue raspberry tidal wave mushrooms, and you're like, well, I don't think that's legal. And then you right. look at it on the packaging, and it's it's something where they're purporting it to be amanita. So I was interested because for one, I have concerns about like the the way that uh like the packaging can potentially like target kids and teens even with cannabis type stuff um right like that question and discussion comes up in a lot of places when things become legalized uh but on top of that to have something that seemed to have some really ambiguous messaging and was uh making itself sound like it might be the type of magic mushrooms that people are used to thinking of but that if they take it without understanding it are likely going to have um, an experience they weren't expecting, which could mean, uh, you know, an adverse outcome. But as we track that further, people were also reporting other things like uh, nurses 
who used gummies and showed up positive for THC at work on drug tests or people who, you know, have had experience with more classic psychedelics and saying like, this wasn't what I was expecting. This really felt like, like a different kind of a trip. Like it didn't just mellow me, mellow me out and help me sleep. Cause like a lot of people you who are using Amanita for the Musimol component, they will use it as a sleep aid or to try to have more intense dreams. Some people are using it to wean off of alcohol for themselves or to try to wean off of benzodiazepines. So if you do that and instead you just end up really high, um, not really what you were going for. Uh, so that's that's been going on for a few a few years, but like in the last year in particular, it's like the market's just exploded with a bunch of different products. And now there's uh, a lot more question about um, what the products are actually made with and safety. Yeah, um, I think it was Masha who said that they, you know, tested some of these products in their labs. And as you said, you know, some were coming up with THC, some were coming up with actual like psilocybin uh, mm -hmm. or psilocin or whatever it is when it pops up on a test. Um, and some with other, like she seemed to indicate maybe even other compounds, you know, like research chemicals, stuff like that. Um, yeah. Quick shout out for Masha. She was on episode five. If folks want to check it out, she works uh, with a lab that's registered with a, the Drug Enforcement Administration. Um, so check that out. But yeah, um, crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. You think you're buying an yep. Amanita mushroom bar and you're buying a freaking low dose cannabis bar with psilocybin in it and maybe some other research chemicals or who knows what so like right. we um we actually were able to get some products tested and i don't i don't want to get too deep into it because it's like focusing on a sp specific sure. potential vendor and but we sent right. some products out that um a lab did some pro bono testing for us like as this as the amanita science and magic facebook group people and the, there's a Ko-Fi page. Like if you search Amanita Ko-Fi, you can find that. And we did share the laboratory results. And that's almost a year ago now. And it was like all over the board what was in, in them. There were some that had like no active products. Others that had, uh, I think, some uh, like some psilocybin. Some had mucimol. Some had ibotenic acid. Like So it was not even that you could guess at what you are getting. Like, I understand that um, that some people are maybe trying to kind of circumvent the law and maybe ambiguous about what they're putting in things, which is, you know, it has its own potential problems. But even in that ambiguity here, you can still have like the same, you know, packaged product and could be getting something totally different case by case. Yeah, it's crazy. And like you had said earlier, like, uh, you know, I have a younger brother that had heard that microdosing might be helpful to him because he's struggled with with different issues as as we all sometimes do and he went to a head shop just to get some papers or whatever and and yeah he was like are those mushrooms and they totally like he came to my house and was like they gave me psilocybin mushrooms like they totally told him it was like psilocybin and i was like no 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 Le read this packaging and that's you know may maybe that's a little bit of an anecdote and that's like on that head shop or whatever for bad information um but like you say i mean you just said it anecdotally i've had somebody close to me go through that experience and luckily i was able to tell them like hey that's not what this is and they still ultimately said they had a great experience but I wanted them to know what they were taking. I was like, there's no way there's just a shop selling you magic mushrooms, which is how a lot of these products seem to be sold, you know? Yep. So, well, what do you think is like the the route forward? Um, you know, they say unregulated sale. So obviously, I feel like off the hip, we say, all right, let's regulate it. Let's is regulate it as easy it. as that or what? Well, so like it's it's interesting that this conversation is coming up right now. And I've in in our Amanita Facebook group, some people, of course, like went full conspiracy angle with it because the that um, that call for potential regulation, if you click through further, is related to um, some research article that was published in the last month or two. And they compared Amanita as being like as toxic to fentanyl. I haven't dug into it that far um, because I, I mean, 
depending on how you want to pose things, like there's a lot of ways you can potentially make like data say what you want. So I, I, but I don't think that's generally the case. Amanita is pretty safe for most people if it's in appropriate doses and they have some education and expectation about what they're getting, or at least with Bucimol. Um, so that came out in June, I think, maybe it was the end of May, right as uh, this issue with diamond shrooms bars is like showing up in the news. Like I was visiting family in Nevada and suffering through my uh, family members ever present Fox News and like it like showed up on there like you're hearing and it and it was funny how they talked about it because it was like don't buy these mushroom chocolate bars and it was like this specific brand and I was like I don't know this is like one no this is not good but it's also kind of like cool in a weird way that they're just saying like don't buy these as if like people are just normally buying mushroom chocolate bars now like it's common enough <laughs> Right. Yeah. So here's the here's the ongoing FDA update on the investigation into this particular product. Um, but it seems that like throughout the country, there there have been some um, some uh, major problems from these um, some hospitalizations. I think they said they're investigating one fatality even. And, and I don't know enough about what's happening there. Like on some level, there's a question of, you know, if you take too much uh musimol like you could be look like you're sleeping for a really long time like i can see somebody walking in and not expecting that to happen and taking like did you know what's going on with this person i can't wake them up or something along those lines and that could result in a visit to the hospital does it mean that harm actually occurred not necessarily but when something you're not expecting happens we have problems um but the but it looks like the lab testing they've done on a couple of those products isn't returning any amanita either. So there's like these two conversations taking place right at the same time. These like who knows what's in them, at least some like 4ACO DMT and um, like some kava uh, extracts or I don't know, it lists it on the FDA thing. We know that was in that bar. And then we have another thing talking about amanita being more toxic than fentanyl. So I have a feeling that regulation of some kind is likely to be coming um, and fingers are crossed that it doesn't mean that it gets that they get scheduled because I don't think we know <laughs> what else to do with drugs that have psychoactive effects other than call them controlled substances. Thank you. And, you know. You, I brought up farm the farm bill earlier. And again, I, I don't mean to get into it, but look. Yeah, you're called the coal memo. You're like you're gonna touch on that stuff. Right, right, exactly. But like these cannabinoids, and and let's just talk about these chocolate bars too. Like all these things, and all, like you say, there's that conversation of what's in them, and it's like, I I hate that it seems like yeah, off the hip, the answer seems to be to schedule the drugs, and, and it seems like even some people in the cannabis like crowd, especially people that are invested, are like applauding the scheduling of uh they want hemp to be scheduled like cannabis and it's like guys the thing about drugs is like we should all agree like if, we, if we're gonna and i know i'm making broad brush statements here but i just i'm kind of on my soapbox for just a moment um if we're going to say that like you know we're a psychonaut or that you're pro drug reform then you should be anti controlled substances act like that's that's just where I'm coming from. And like I, I the Controlled Substances Act, just the way that I look at it is like that doesn't mean no regulation. Alcohol and tobacco are highly regulated and they are not controlled substances. So what are your any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, when it comes to natural products, I'm against scheduling. Like I think you should be able to pick things and harvest things. Um, yeah. and so, uh, so definitely I can, I can be with that. Um, I mean, I'm a pharmacist. I understand a lot of like the other side of that yeah, picture. Yeah. So I'm not like against having controlled substances on mm -hmm. principle. Um, I definitely think we have a lot of room to improve how we handle uh, drugs in general and that we should be moving to some sort of mechanism where adults can engage with things with education. Um, 
So I'd like to see people have access to safe supplies and things like that. I don't really know, you know, what that looks like because we do also have the whole medical side of things and there are needs to track that and regulate it and make sure that, you know, insurance isn't being defrauded. And, right. So that part gets complicated, yeah. but um, I don't, I, I, I can support regulation perhaps, but I don't support uh, mushrooms being further restricted into controlled substance categories. And to me, the regulation, I think, should be more on like uh, a general uh, like production facility kind of a way, right? Like we have lot numbers. Right. Uh, we track where we're getting our ingredients, you know, whoever we're getting our ingredients from, if they're giving a, like a final type product that gets mixed in, they should have lot numbers, right? You should be able to easily track things and figure out what in went into something so that if there is a problem, <laughs> like it's happening with diamond shroom bars, um, you can follow those trails and figure out where the problem occurred. Um, not just restrict it altogether. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for like hel helping to, well, well, the thing I like that you led with was talking about like access to the plant kind of in in the spirit of multiple points of access i think that's the kind of the point i was trying to make for folks if if i got lost in my soapbox speech it was more so that like like you say just having a plant as a controlled substance like maybe yeah we can talk about the derivatives and synthetic forms of it maybe that gets into like marinol for example that's an fda approved cannabis drug right um but like you say having a you know, a mushroom scheduled or the cannabis plant scheduled. It's just like, it's just bad. <laughs> it's not good policy, you know? Yeah. I think it should be like having tomatoes. Like, you know, if you're selling right. 40,000 tons of tomatoes, there's some regulation involved there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I'm sure they make like tomato extract or something like there's like, you know, like there, when it starts being processed in a lab, it gets a lot number, like just treat them more that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad that you said it that that because you actually did just touch on one of my favorite things from it's like we keep bouncing back over to cannabis. But of course, there's a lot of relation, you know, it's like the communities blend together. But <laughs> um, it's the idea the model for legalization is already out there. It's tomatoes. More tomatoes are grown in America by home gardeners than are produced commercially. Yet this is the important part. There is a robust commercial market for tomatoes and tomato products of all type, canned, vine ripened, organic, sauces, soups, etc. Yeah. At, at the same time, small scale specialty cultivators do well, selling their produce at farmers markets. Home gardeners with extra tomatoes share their bounty with their neighbors as gifts in trade or through informal informal sales. Cannabis and I'd say psychedelics, like you know, especially Amanita muscaria mushrooms and psilocybin, could be handled the same way. So. I like yep. that you brought that up. Because... And I didn't even know you had that on the ready. Oh, I just Googled it. I have, I just have that <laughs> off the hip because that's the tomato model. If people want to Google it for themselves, it's the idea that, yeah, I, I like that, that first line there because it's almost unbelievable, but I fact checked it and it's possible that my fact checking wasn't as rigorous as some, but more tomatoes are grown in America by home gardeners than are produced commercially. And I think that's an important I mean, I point. I that. Yeah, it, it, but it, it was like, man, really? Because like you think about all the stores, like there's a lot of, t you know, you can go to any store right now and get a tomato. I figured it would have been like more or produced co commercially. But yeah, like you say, it's it's more likely and even this, and I've tried to fact check it, it seems that more tomatoes are grown by home gardeners. And I bring that all up to say, back to where we started, plants can obviously be grown safely with minimal regulation with with no issues you know and that's kind of i think that's the part where we agree on on the controlled substances act that that i just hope that people that that really hits home for people like you say the answer should be adding oversight things like lot numbers testing to ensure that what you're getting is what it says it is not let's just throw it in a you know scheduled drug and make it so that we can't do anything with it it's like well right yeah, cottage food laws, I don't know how strong they are where you are, but out in Oregon, there's there's quite a bit of leeway for um, people making various like foods or selling eggs out of their home and things like that. So I think, you know, you have you have personal use and then you have 
cottage industry laws, which is designed to be like out of your domicile in most cases. And then you have commercial scale activities. And I think you can have regulations that apply on the, uh, you know, the, the cottage scale and the commercial scale. And then you just let people do what they want with their things at their homes in their yards. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, cool. Well, I feel like we kind of nailed down the answer, but just to give you the space on it, it sounds like we think the answer to some of these concerns uh, is to regulate these products, right? Not schedule them, but just to regulate them. A little bit. And that may make me unpopular with some of the, you know, people I know who make things, but <laughs> I I also tell them I don't think it's reasonable that they get to exist in the gray area vacuum forever as popularity increases. Like, it's going to yeah. happen, but yeah. hopefully we can influence it to go in a better route than some would like it to. Yeah, and I hope it's, you know, it's seen as less of a slapping of the hand and more of a like a helping one out, you know, just to bring it back to tomatoes. Like I actually recently heard that Flint, Michigan got their water fixed, and I hope that that's true, uh, but let's just say we were living in – I know this is a weird example, but hear me out here. Let's just say I lived in Flint, Michigan, and I was growing tomatoes with that water. Probably not a great idea, right? So I just see that as – the reason I bring that up is because like when we talk about home gardening, like you should be mindful of the soil you use. You should be mindful of the water you use, nutrients, pesticides, et cetera. And so to take that to making any other product, it's like, yeah, we should be mindful of what we're putting into it and making sure that people don't have a bad experience. So. Like I, I said, have I hope... a punk song in my head. I think it's MDC, Radioactive Chocolate. You should listen to that one after. <laughs> I will. Uh, Her Her Hershey, Pennsylvania, after Three Mile Island. Oh, wow. This Radioactive actually... Chocolate forever and ever. That sounds much deeper than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> I was like, damn. <laughs> sounds like a fun song. No, that doesn't. It sounds kind of crazy. Um but yeah, I hope you 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 get my point here and that I, you know, I hope that people cuz look, here I am talking about the tomato model and how I believe that the, these things can exist without with with little regulation. But on the other hand, now we're talking about regulation. I, I only am saying that for like, a, yeah, you know, commercial levels and, you know, these big industry operators that have these packaging. And like you say, it's being marketed like it's just a normal CPG product. But unlike a normal CPG product, it's not overseen by most of the processes we, you know, just assume when you see a CPG product, did that make sense? Yeah. I feel like that's the point you're, we're all trying to make here. So, Yep. And it's so easy to make it look fully official and get high quality packaging. And, you know, I would argue that a lot of the vendors who purchase these things for sale probably also don't understand that it's not coming through like normal market channels. Yeah. Yeah. And when, you know, I know this might seem silly, but when somebody puts legal and bold letters on the packaging, for some reason, it's might just be like a sign. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but for I guess what I was trying to say, I agree with what you were saying, but what I was trying to say for some people, they're like, they see the word legal and they're just like, concerns are out of mind. You know what I mean? And it's like, legal doesn't always mean healthy, but that's yeah, a, that's a for conversation sure. for another day. <laughs> So, all right. Well, um, Regina, I just want to thank you again for your time today. I know you're a really busy person. And um, before we go, did you, I wanted to give you the space. Was there anything that, you know, we hadn't touched on today that you feel we need to just wanted to give you some space before we close? Um, I mean, I, I mentioned that Facebook group. If people have an interest in Amanita, it's a great one to check out. I'm not around in there too much, even though I, I help from time to time. Um, it, there's like 80,000 people. Um, I think it's really good when you're learn trying to learn more about things like this to to like cast a wide cast a wide net and try to collect a lot of different information um, and not rely on just one or two people, especially when it comes to um, areas that like don't have a lot of what well, uh, formed research and whatnot. Um, and then, uh, this, our group has like a lot of the science focus in it, but then they also, uh, very much accept that there's like the kind of spiritual element and we've got, you know, people with, uh, their magic side of things, which is not mine. So I don't get in those <laughs> conversations, but, um, 
it can be it can be really uh, hard to find high quality information um, without the science there. So um, trying to to hear a lot of user reports, learn how to process things yourself, like put a little effort in um, if you want to engage with uh, with some of these things and and make sure you know what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. Well. I hope that we're able to connect again sometime in person, but if not, I'm sure I'll see you at another incubator. Um, so on that note, folks, I hope you found as much value in this conversation as I did. And I guess I should ask Regina, and if you don't, it's totally okay. No, no problem. Um, but you did mention you, you like give presentations or if people were wanting to like hire you, would they just connect with you on LinkedIn? Oh, or do, yeah. If you don't want to plug that, that's fine. I'm just... No, I thought I'd ask. That's okay. You. Let's see. Um, I don't know. Like I, I'm all over the internet doing different things. Um, so I have uh, given some talks on this topic to pharmacists. I'm going to be down in New Mexico in the fall presenting um, to pharmacists on uh, Amanita and psilocybin, um, trying to to get that segment since it's you know, my my people there um, informed and aware of things that they need to know about that their patients and customers are engaging with, and they might. Might be getting questions about. Um, uh, I have a website, um, Regina Moore.me, Dr. Regina Moore.me. Google me, Cole. Dr. Cool. Regina. We'll put it in the show. I notes, go on folks. there so, so little, but I have a website. It's got some contact information there. Um, and uh, I'm also on um, Twitter at Frugal Farm, F R U G A L P H A R M. I'm not sure you want to hear all of my inner thoughts, but if you're interested, <laughs> I'm also there. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm open to other discussions, um, interested in a lot of, uh, a lot of topics where, uh, mushrooms and psychedelics meet up, um, two different interests that collided very much in the last five years or so. Yeah. Well, perfect. I'm glad you were able to get that in. I, I should have asked earlier, but again, folks, that'll all be in the show notes. If you want to go to Regina Moore.me. If you'd rather just click on it, that'll be in the show notes. Um, Regina, thank you again. Yes, and folks, thank you, Cole. We'll see you on the next episode of the Cole Memo. Take care. All right, bye. Bye.